Hey guys, and welcome back to Unit 5 of AP World History. Last time, we talked about the Enlightenment and we were focused specifically on what are these new ideas that are spreading globally. In class, then we looked at the kind of major philosophes who provided us with a lot of new ideas on the way that science and reason could fix a lot of issues that are facing humans. Today, we're looking at political revolutions and we're looking specifically at the American Revolution. Let's get to it. So before we move forward and actually plant ourselves firmly in America, let's have a quick reminder of the Enlightenment and why it's so important for what we're about to talk about today and tomorrow. And so we remember from last time that the Enlightenment is a political, social, and intellectual movement that is going to compel people to view the way that they function in society differently from pretty much the way that humans have exi existed up until this point. Now, the main actors that we see in the Enlightenment are the philosophes. And the philosophes themselves are these intellectuals who take ideas that were from the Renaissance, from the scientific revolution, and apply it to human problems. And they come up with a lot of different ideas as we saw in class. The biggest ideas we really need to understand as we move into the American Revolution, when it comes to Enlightenment ideas, are liberalism, natural rights, and the social contract. That liberalism is a fundamental belief that freedom, equality, democracy, and human rights are a inalienable part of what it is to be a person in a political society. Natural rights then goes hand in hand with that idea, saying that every person, regardless of who they are, are born with a certain set of rights. Now, this will directly be a part of the American Revolution and the ideas that the American Revolution pushes. And then the last thing that we really need to understand is this idea of the social contract. And the social contract is quite simply just a contract that is set up among people living in a political society saying that, hey, the people who live there have agreed to live by the laws that have been set up. All right, with that in mind then, we can move into the American Revolution since we have these core set of ideas from the Enlightenment that are really going to inform how Americans operate at this point. One of the biggest questions that we have to ask is what was the American Revolution anyways? And the reason why I ask this question is because when you look specifically at say Google image search and you type in American Revolution, more than likely you would expect to see George Washington a ton. You might expect to see some of the bigger set piece battles of the American Revolution. And you might see a couple scenes of the Declaration of Independence being signed, but regardless, the reason why it's so important to set aside a definition of what the revolution was is because as Americans, we kind of have a misunderstanding of what the American Revolution was. One of the best places to get a good perspective on the American Revolution is actually from a letter from John Adams, one of the pivotal actors in the American Revolution who becomes the second president of the United States. And later on in his life, he's writing to his former good friend who turned enemy, who turned into a pen pal during the 18 teens and they're writing to each other and John Adams is reflecting on what the American Revolution was. And he says to Thomas Jefferson, as to the history of the revolution, my ideas may be peculiar, perhaps singular. What do we mean by the revolution? The war? That was no part of the revolution. It was only an effect, a consequence of it. The revolution was in the minds of the people and this was affected from 1760 to 1775 in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. And so the really significant thing that we need to be able to understand here about the American Revolution is that the American Revolution is a large sweeping political, social, intellectual movement that is fundamentally changing the way the American colonies are relating to, at the time, Great Britain and becoming independent. The Revolutionary War is an effect of that revolution. And so it's important for us to understand that when we say American Revolution, we don't mean the war. We mean the social and political changes that are occurring within America at this time. So when we talk about the American Revolution, we, we are talking about the war. And so even though Google image search would have us believe that a lot of the revolution is a war, it really is happening way before that and it's got a lot of differing impacts and effects and causes that are just quite frankly bigger than the war itself. The war, the Revolutionary War, where George Washington becomes the star, 
is just the actual effect of the changes that are trying to be affected. And the war is trying to make sure that the revolution is successful. And so with that, we need to look at several things that help us understand what the American Revolution is, especially within the context of the Enlightenment. Now, depending on how much time you have to really look into the American Revolution, you could talk for days about the causes of this movement that's happening in America. But we really don't have that much time, so we have to kind of condense it down and do a few things. So what are those few things? Well, number one, one of the major reasons why American colonists decide to break up with Great Britain in the 1770s is because of a set of changes that occur in the 1760s that directly impacts the colonists' pocketbooks. And so one of the big changes that happens is that France and Great Britain during the 17, early 1700s had been fighting a series of wars that culminated in the Seven Years' War. We spoke about this in glass before we left for Christmas break. Now, the Seven Years' War was super expensive and Britain paid a ton of money to win that war. After the war, Britain simply said, hey, we're gonna leave some of our redcoats, we're gonna leave some of our troops in the colonies to protect this new area that we just got. Now, we're gonna ask that the colonists help pay for that, because that makes sense. And looking back historically, that does make sense, at least from an imperial perspective. The colonists, though, have been infused with all these different enlightenment ideas now for some time. And so with these new ideas, they begin to have potential problems with being taxed when they don't have representation in the lawmaking body in England. And as we will come to see, as these economic policies get passed, like the Stamp Act, Townsend Acts, there's a litany of them that we could talk about that's better suited to an A-push class, but these taxation measures really do start to change the way that colonists think about themselves, at least politically, in relationship with Great Britain. The really fascinating thing, though, about the American Revolution isn't necessarily just the economic and political issues that get brought up and really leads to a kind of climactic moment in the 1770s, but it's also the way in which both men and women are able to take part in this resistance that's happening in the American colonies. On screen, we see an example of the No Stamp Act teapot, which was all the rage. If Amazon had existed, it would have been sold out. Colonists choose to voice their frustration in a variety of ways. And one way that women could do it was by purchasing things like the lovely and fancy No Stamp Act kettle, as you see on screen. Uh, you could wear clothes that are not made in England. They are called homespun because you spend them at home. And women can voice their frustration just as equally as men through a variety of different ways. And so women have a chance here during this revolution to actually advance their own potential political and social equality in ways that they hadn't before. And so the cause of the American Revolution, if we're condensing them down into their most simplistic form, it's going to be economic resistance to Britain trying to tax the American colonies. And those colonists begin to say, that's not okay. And the reason why they say that's not okay, that Britain should not be able to tax them because they don't have representation in the British Parliament, the body that creates laws for all of the British Empire, they don't believe it's fair that they should have to abide by the taxes that they try to pass. Because the colonists do not send someone to England as their representative, they believe you should not be able to tax us. Which is where the really famous kind of chant and slogan, no taxation without representation, is really born. And so once the American colonists have really established a political purpose to this revolution, they have to find a way then to secure their independence from Great Britain. Now admittedly, the path to independence takes a long time. And we'll see some of this frustration and kind of feet dragging in class a little bit more. But it does take a while for Americans to fully settle on a path of independence. But once you say, hey, I want to be independent from Great Britain, you still got to earn it. And so that's where this war between the American colonies and Great Britain becomes a pivotal moment. Because unless the American colonies can actually defeat the British and remove them from the colonies, the revolution means nothing. And so the role of George Washington becomes so important in the history of the American Revolution because he leads the military campaigns that ultimately are going to secure the revolution 
for the American colonists. Now, the really big part about the Revolutionary War itself that we need to understand really only revolves around how exactly Americans are able to win. And the only reason why the Americans are able to win is actually thanks to the French. Now, the Americans win a pretty decisive victory at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. And for the longest time, the Americans have been trying to get the French to help, and the Americans have been unsuccessful because the French want to see that the Americans can potentially win this thing on their own before they join in and help beat up on the British. And so with the victory at Saratoga, the Americans now are able to convince the French to join in the Revolutionary War, and as a result, are able to ultimately secure the victory by 1783. Now again, the French are going to spend a tremendous amount of money helping the Americans fight this war. And so we will pick that piece up when we get to the French Revolution because it ties directly into one of the reasons why the French themselves look at the successful revolution in the Americas and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should do that. So the question then really becomes, how exactly can we look at the American Revolution as a potentially enlightened revolution. And there's two main ways we can go about it. One of the main products of the American Revolution is a short little pamphlet called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine is an immigrant from Great Britain who comes over to the Americas in the 1770s, mid 1770s. So he has not been in the colonies for the better part of the revolution. He comes pretty late in the game, looks around and says, Okay, I think I got some ideas of what I can talk about. Goes into his room for a while, comes out with this pamphlet that has some drastic and far-reaching implications. Now, Thomas Paine has decided from the start to write this document in very simplistic style. So he's not trying to write it for the hoity-toity crowd who are <laughs> the really wealthy people. He's writing it for everybody. He's writing it for the people in the taverns who can then talk about it with their friends. And he's got a lot of ideas about the nature of the relationship of Great Britain and the colonies. And he comes out with this fundamental idea that it makes zero sense, guys, that Great Britain is able to rule over the American colonies. And for that matter, it makes pretty much zero sense that America would be independent from Great Britain. Now, the most famous kind of line that Thomas Paine gives us is that he proves this point using perfect enlightenment rationale. He goes and looks at nature and says, you know, nowhere in nature does it say that a king should have a son and then that son should be king. Just nowhere in nature are you gonna find that someone just by birth is being given all of this power and prestige just because they were born to someone else. It doesn't happen in nature. He then comes back and says, it makes even less sense because when you look at King George III, who is the king of Great Britain at this time, uh, you would think they'd give us someone better if that was the case, huh? Because he's kind of lame. And so Thomas Paine is making this case that in nature, it makes no sense whatsoever to have this type of setup. And for a lot of people who are kind of on the fence about whether or not America should be independent, Thomas Paine sways them and they now become convinced that, yeah, you're probably right. It doesn't really make sense that we're a part of Great Britain. We should probably do our own thing. And the last justification or example of how the American Revolution is really an enlightened revolution and helps propel this enlightenment thought of political revolution across the globe is the Declaration of Independence itself. Now, if you look at the Declaration of Independence itself, you'll see plenty of traces of some of the most obvious examples being the natural rights that all humans are endowed with. And Jefferson makes a point as the main writer of at least the initial draft of the Declaration of Independence to make sure that, and spread this idea that all humans, regardless of who they are, are born with equal rights. Now, this becomes a huge contradiction for a lot of Americans, as we'll see that women and enslaved Americans try and petition for more rights, to which a lot of these Americans that are in control of politics at this point say, no, 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 we weren't talking to you. Jefferson also goes on to really borrow from John Locke and kind of convey what those rights are, that all Americans are given this potential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Jefferson chooses to change what John Locke had said. John Locke had said life, liberty, and property. And Jefferson looks at that and says, mm, how about you have a shot at happiness? That feels better. 
And so they're maintaining these enlightenment ideas while also tweaking them to make them serve the best purpose for Americans. And so the American Revolution really is this first moment where we see the enlightenment have a direct influence on a political society in which a political revolution occurs, is secured through a war in itself, and it provides the world with an example of a potential for change. And as we will see, once the American Revolution is successful, a lot of different societies around the world then look at it and say, well, maybe we could secure a similar change through similar ideas and measures. And so with that, guys, that's going to be the quickest run through the American Revolution you'll ever get. The big focus is, can we understand how the Enlightenment has worked its way into the American Revolution and help spread some of these ideas that developed in Europe, but have really been played out in a practical fashion to to secure a political revolution in America. Next time, get excited, we'll be looking at the French Revolution and we'll be chopping off a few more heads than we did today. With that, guys, have a great day. Thank you for being awesome. Bye-bye.